think it took us a long time to move from uh, strictly cons uh, structural uh, analysis and uh, restoration to understand that this um, driving force behind Young's work and the collaboration he had with Captain Bowman was for fireproofing. And the reason for that was it, it is a direct descendant of heavy mill construction um, that we find in Britain. And I have recently, fairly recently, uh, examined a number of these structures. What was wanted was a building uh, that wouldn't burn and the lighting was um, gas flames without any framework around them. Um, the idea was then to use very heavy timbers and um, with these uh, timbers you got slow burn construction. There was a movement um, in the early 19th century in Britain in particular um, to start using uh, iron to replace wood members and um, cast iron was used and uh, it was uh, a most unfortunate uh, choice because it's immensely strong in compression and very brittle and weak in tension and so um, a number of mills by Strutt and others um, came to four and uh, there are a number of um, illustrations of, very, of various patented um, cast iron systems. I need to go back for a moment and talk about iron um, which is a word that uh, you find at 84 lumber and it isn't. Um, they talk about wrought iron fences. We haven't produced wrought iron in this country for a century. Um, and they're nothing but mild steel. In the middle of the um, Black Plague in the 14th century, about uh, 1360, um, there was a movement away from blacksmiths uh, producing of iron to a large oven, a Stuck oven in German, and uh, it produced uh, very large quantities of cast iron. If you worked the cast iron and could uh, somehow eliminate the carbon uh, down to nearly zero, uh, you got wrought iron. Wrought iron has about a half a percent or less of carbon. A good cast iron has three or three and a half percent um, carbon. And it wasn't till um, a man called Court, and uh, I believe his assistant was the real brains behind it, a man called Onion, in 1760, that uh, they developed a um, system called puddling. And any of you that are interested, read the very short novel, uh, Life in the Ironworks, right here in Wheeling. And what they're doing is, is uh, raking back and forth molten cast iron and trying to drive out the carbon and uh, produce wrought iron. And in doing so, they could produce um, sheets of iron as well as some uh, elementary shapes. And this is really important for this uh, part of the talk on um, this building. You could do plates, you could do angles, um, and various other shapes. And the big thing in this country uh, was to roll railroad rails. And in fact, the great B&O that got here in 1852, Christmas Eve, was built on Welsh rails. There was a strong interest 
uh, in producing a more complicated shape. And this is a very important part of what I want to say about this particular building, and that is the eye beam with the top and bottom flange. If you take and stack hot cast iron in layers, you can roll this, but the difficulty is how do you get the rolls between the flanges and get it out again? And this, uh, this took the Trenton Iron Works um, a number of years, and they finally succeeded in rolling a uh, wrought iron nine inch beam, and there's one of them right behind me, behind this wall. Um, and there's one back there, and for those that are interested, I'll show them to you. Um, these beams then uh, replaced heavy timber work, and it was believed, but not quite correctly, that um, iron doesn't burn. But if it gets to eight or 900 degrees, it loses all its strength, so it might as well. Um, it was then that um, Young, ABB Young, uh, worked with uh, Captain Bowman of the U.S. Army Engineers, and they decided to uh, do a heavy mill building uh, in a fireproof mode. And if you go around this building, you'll see the doors are cast iron, the shutters are cast iron, everything's cast iron or wrought. Um, they wanted to eliminate wood uh, wherever they could. Um, so what was the idea was to build a wrought iron framework. Some people say it is the predecessor of the American skyscraper. And it is a, an iron frame building, but it is not a pure structure in the sense that the outside walls are supported on this sandstone um, and it's not a pure frame. Um, so you had a series of beams running at five foot centers across um, this part of the building for 20 feet and you had 15 feet in the corridor upstairs. It goes up through the various floors and then another 20 feet on the other side. And the idea was to produce a floor which was fireproof. And um, that was quite a challenge. It seems rather simple today when we have steel and reinforced concrete, but it wasn't then. And um, they, they did an ingenious thing. They put nine inch beams uh, spanning 20 feet, 15 feet in the corridor, and then another 20 feet on the other side at five foot centers. And between them, they built very shallow brick arches. Uh, they span five feet and rise about five to six inches. Um, and uh, there's an example in the corner. If you behave yourself, I'll show it to you. Um, they're there to be seen. Uh, no, in, a, in a, a, a restricted room, but I got the permission to do this. <laughs> so these, uh, th this was the essence of this build, building, and uh, one of 10 that were done. And these used these new beams. Uh, the ones for this building were rolled in 1856 building was finished in 1859 um, and it has this uh, wrought iron framework in it and that is the uh, part that really intrigued me about this uh, this whole building and I've uh, worked with people at uh, Loyola University in Baltimore and uh, we've done uh, some uh, really detailed work um, on the wrought iron, and uh, this colleague of mine was also working on the USS Monitor that sunk off the coast. Um, these beams were rolled, and there were some defects in them, and the 
closer examination on at a detailed level showed that they added uh, molten wrought iron top and bottom to make it up to nine inches and if you look at this uh, under a microscope you can see this line uh, in top and bottom I'm not aware in this building that any of these have ever separated but this was a great struggle and the Trenton Iron Works was um, to be applauded for this work and they complained that it cost them $30,000 uh, and the first run was not successful. So this, every one of these floors has a, uh, a five foot span brick arch. Now you're not going to walk on a corrugated floor like this so they filled it in with cinders and put what we call sleepers timber members and the floors that you see upstairs are nailed to these sleepers. That's the only wood there is uh, in the building. Some preliminary analysis of this indicated that the uh, floor capacity uh, was only about 40 pounds per square foot. We need something around 85 to meet modern requirements. And it looked as though the preliminary design that was done by others was inaccurate. And I got involved in this and was really intrigued uh, with the possibility. It showed if you use the floor going along with the beams as a great uh, um, tension members for the beams at the bottom and the arches at the top, that uh, we have a capacity well over 90 pounds per square foot. So we took off the uh, load limits on various rooms in the building. Um, and it has, uh, it has stood uh, almost um, without exception uh, from 1859. Now there's a couple of interesting details here. Wheeling, if you're going to deal in these buildings, you really need, need to know some background about Wheeling and its great manufacturing center. The second city in Virginia. Uh, Shipbuilding, steam engines, puddling iron, um, as well as textiles and other things. Um, and it had a uh, great history in doing cast iron works and all of these columns, which you really can't see the tops, all of the columns here are in cast iron because they take their loads vertically and they don't bend. And so the great strength of um, cast iron can be used very effectively. And in an ingenious way, and I don't know the details, there were uh, boilers down here. Um, and there was a rather primitive uh, central heating and um, the heating was done through these columns, which was quite unusual. I don't know of any other example of this. And it uh, rises to each floor and then is distributed um, with uh, box beams uh, to floor registers. And if you go up to the courthouse, you can see these grills in the floor, and that's where the heat comes out. Uh, it obviously didn't provide uh, enough heat, and there are uh, fireplaces in every room. And when we were doing the restoration, we got uh, replacement parts directly from Italy uh, for these fireplaces, which gave background heat. So this is the essence of this particular building, um, and it is... Um, it's a national landmark, in my mind, um, and one that really ought to be celebrated here in Wheeling. Um, it's almost a, a unique one-off uh, project. And as I say, if you go around in the building, you'll see the cast iron in the stairs and elsewhere. Really, absolutely first-rate uh, local materials. The beams were rolled in Trenton 
New Jersey and brought here. And there's a wonderful story because the, the beams that were supposed to go to the custom house in New Orleans ended up in Wheeling. And the beam back here uh, very clearly has painted on it Wheeling. And so for a historian, it's wonderful to have a controversy like this. Lots of correspondence. Who's to blame? Uh, what are we going to do with these beams? We're going to send them down the river again uh, to New Orleans. And um, I did um, quite a lot of structural analysis on these beams. And I can assure you that this building is quite stable um, and has, um, has served well. Its only um, disadvantage, I think, is that uh, until 53 locks and dams were built on the Ohio River, uh, this area was subjected to flooding. And this building, including where you are now, was underwater on several occasions. Um, this is all flood prone. Um, but the uh, Ohio River locks and dams using uh, uh, a French system uh, survives uh, to this day. Now that's, um, that's the essence of this building and there's nothing like it anywhere in the area in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio that I'm aware of. And the, uh, there is a fine example of uh, this construction in the uh, satellite post office in Washington, D.C., but you've got to be a friend of the postmaster in order to go up in the attic. And you can see all the good stuff up there. So that's, um, and the wrought iron work that was done, uh, other than the beams, was all done here, uh, puddling. Uh, Rebecca Harding Davis, Life in the Iron Mills, And get your students to read this novel because it's only 67 pages long. And there was a feminist who wrote the um, wrote a review, a critical review, and the review was longer than the novel. <laughs> but it really does show you what it was like in Wheeling. And uh, these guys, when they were off duty, duty would lie on the the ashes, which were warm, so they could keep warm in the wintertime. Charles Ellett Jr., I'll mention, uh, with the uh, suspension bridge, was always of a rather delicate uh, uh, constitution, and he lived in Elm Grove, and he walked to the Wheeling Suspension Bridge every day. The air pollution here was terrible. He thought it not uh, uh, conducive to his health. So I would entertain any questions at this point on this particular building. Yeah? Um, Wheeling was a great uh, center for ironwork. Why were the beams not made here? There was no rolling mill in the entire world that could roll beams nine inches deep. Except in Trenton. Trenton. I see. And in the, uh, sometime since the early part of this cent uh, last century, there was a hat column on the south side of the building that was removed. That was not then part of the original structure? No. No, and I didn't mention that. There was a fourth floor added to this building vertically, and there was what uh, in covered bridges we call a wart. Um, it looked like a silo out yeah. on the side here. That was not original, and we took that away. And in its place, we've put a uh, uh, modern uh, fire stairwell uh, to meet safety, fire safety standards. Yeah, that was all done. Uh, I must tell you that uh, I worked on this uh, weekly for a very long time. We got uh, a man called Robson from London 
to do the wood graining. And if you go upstairs, you uh, call the um, specifications for historic preservation by the Secretary of the Department of Interior. And this is often quoted. Uh, it's rather like the Bible. Everybody quotes it, but they never read it. And we never read this thing until there's a problem. Then we read everything. Um, but this is the guideline for doing historic preservation and what you can and cannot uh, do. Um, any other questions? Yes? You had said that, they were, that their goal was to create a fireproof building, correct? Yes. I guess I'm thinking, obviously, in retrospect, they have a fireplace in every room. Right. But I'm guessing at the time that was what was available. Is that? That's, yes. Is that Central very heating was not very common. Okay. I just went, right. And this central heating system didn't, just provided background heat. If you like your room at 60 degrees, it's probably a satisfactory, but there were fireplaces in, uh, in all of the administrative offices. Now, I don't know how, yeah. In Rebecca Harding's book, the main male character carved figures out of some material that I can't remember the exact word, it was K-R-O-G-H or something. Uh, and the things I've read about that book says nobody knows what that KRO stuff was. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what it was? It was probably what is called a salamander. And that's a big clinker that is pulled out of the puddling huh. furnace and cooled. I think it would be very hard to work. Because it yep. would be hard. But I think that's what it is. So it was iron, basically. What? It was iron then? Or, or do you mean it was from the fire? It was from the puddling. Yeah. Uh, and you, you, you would get uh, calcium carbonate as a byproduct um, because you were reducing the carbon um, in the cast iron to make wrought iron. And so you got a lot of calcium uh, available in the calcium dioxide and uh, uniting with the. Uh, Well, the clinker would be very hot when it comes out, well over 2,000 degrees. Uh, and that's what that probably is, and I know what you're talking about. Uh, and, uh, I don't know whether that na uh, novel is available still. Yes. Uh, you can download it on the internet, and it's been reprinted a number of times, too. Yeah. I, if you're interested in wheeling, that's the book for you. And um, I don't want to... Uh, get into a long feminist argument, but she was touted at the time as the American Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> and Life in the Iron Mills was probably her, her great swan song. Uh, the field had moved quite a long way, and uh, you know that there was a fire. And Cass Gilbert came in in the 20th century and did a very classical uh, state capital, complete with the uh, old leaf on the dome. And marble inside. Yes, yes, a, a different approach altogether. This, this was that was very much more classical. But the original ones were fires. Like, how many fires were there? Like, I know at least one of the capital buildings in Charleston burned down. Yes. They more or less, Cass Gilbert was fortunate. He more or less started from scratch. Um, and this was to be a grand new capital of a brand new state uh, formed in 1861. Uh, 63. Um, yeah. Hi. When they, um, 
when the building was first constructed and opened, was the um, was the iron grained like it is today, and or how much was done? Were columns done, doorway frames, doors, etc.? Was it grained, or did they just leave it as as is? Um, we had very good examples of the graining in various places, but it was pretty largely neglected. And uh, the wood graining and getting the correct grain in and making it look like wood is a real art. Um, and Robson emigrated to the United States to do graining. And this was his, one of his uh, uh, masterpieces. Now, I do have a problem with wood grained elevator doors. Um, <laughs> I think that's not entirely appropriate. Um, and uh, it is beyond the Secretary of Interior's standards on that. But the floors are perfectly adequate for public um, assembly uh, on every floor. Um, Heidi, I don't know any. We just wood grain the whole thing that, that we knew it was in the original specification. So it was originally specified to be wood grain. They didn't leave. Yeah, and it was pretty crude. It wasn't anything like as good as we okay. we've done it. Um, yeah, you put on a base coat and then you coat and then you work the wood graining on that. And uh, a really good wood grainer would say, "Do you want walnut or oak?" <laughs> I just didn't know that, you know, with the oncoming of the Civil War and that kind of thing, if it took time to grain, you know, columns and doorways yes, and it, doors. Yes, the answer. Um, they didn't want uh, naked iron. Okay. Um, and they would, uh, you didn't have to frame out around the columns. Uh, you could wood grain right on them. Uh, and that saved money, and uh, I think is a very notable architectural feature of the building. And you can see it on the, the post office floor and the other two above that. Uh, a wonderful job. How long did it take from start to when it was finished to re renovate, I guess? You mean the original building? The original building, the beams were delivered in 1856, and the building was finished in 1859. So they were setting beams over a couple of years uh, during that period. Right. I think there might be the renovation when, it, when the building was... Oh my goodness, I didn't think it would ever finish. <laughs> I, I came up every week because um, I was on the committee and I worked with the uh, do any of you know Tracy Stevens? Yeah. He was a very well-known architect, and I worked with Tracy. So it took years. Well, he worked, uh, he was unmarried, and worked as an architect into his mid-90s. And I had the privilege of working with him. And his drawings are at West Virginia University. I think if you want to do some really deep research, you'd have to go to Morgantown, um, and you would, uh, um, that wouldn't be a happy request because they'd have to unroll these things, but it could be done. All his um, drawings were given there, and these were the days when he was doing ink on linen for drawings. Not all of his drawings are there. We have some friends of Wheeling still has some here. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you, Jean. I didn't know that. Yeah. You're looking at someone who did ink on linen. Um, it's the finest quality linen, and if you made a big mistake, you could uh, have a new shirt or something <laughs> because this didn't. We had to do that for a lot of the work that I did overseas. Paper would just disintegrate in a matter of weeks. And so all the drawings were on linen. Yeah. Are 
been involved with or in touch with anyone that's involved in the renovation on the island, the um, former governors? It's privately owned. That's too. private. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. No. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't realize it was a private. I was involved with the Second Presbyterian Church. Really wanted to save that building, and not have it torn down. But it needed a whole new roof system and things, which I found quite exciting. <laughs> You'll be working with us on the Edmundville Bridge this summer. Oh yes, that's true. Thank, thank you, Jeremy. Um, rail Trail Bridge, and we're, we're hoping to get that uh, renovated. And I'm working on that. We we were amazed when we went on the walking trail to go through the, the tunnel, the wonderful trail system, I mean, that can get you all over the place, and so the Setton Hill Bridge will be a really wonderful addition, too. That's going to help rail trail a lot. Yeah, a lot of these teachers bike and walk with their kids and, and all these sorts of things, and, and while, while we were through the tunnel, ladies, how many people did we see? We, we saw like 15 people just in the short time that we were walking around, so it's very, very well used. Edmundville Bridge gets probably 10 people an hour, so very back and forth between yeah. Lawrence Ferry and, and the island. I don't know how to say no, so I'm going to I twist his arm well. Yeah. Jeremy, let's open that door in the back and let people see these jack arch floors. Um, I'll have to get Travis. Step on the bridge. Yeah, go on the bridge, and I'll, I'll let Travis know. Go ahead and talk about the bridge, and then when you're done, you can take people to show Okay, them. I'll do that. Um, I've spent an awful lot of time on suspension bridges, both here and in Britain, um, over the years, and I got started with an interest um, by Beverly Flutie and others here in Wheeling on the suspension bridge, which was uh, repaired in 1956. Um, I need to say a couple of things about uh, the long lineage of suspension bridges, and it's not Western Europe, it's China. Well, I, I should say, my wife just got back from Peru. She could probably tell you about uh, Peruvian uh, suspension bridges as well. Um, we have good records of this before the Christian era. And we, I have uh, information from uh, Professor Needham at Cambridge um, on a chain link a suspension bridge made of chains in uh, the, the uh, second century in the Christian era. An iron suspension bridge. People hadn't even thought of them in this country at that time. Now there are two points that really need to be emphasized greatly. Um, it would probably be worth an exhibition um, there was a man called James Finley from Northern Ireland. Um, this whole uh, group of people here were staunch Presbyterians, and uh, James Finley uh, developed the modern uh, suspension bridge. And uh, the first one was over Jacobs Creek in 1808, very early. The Meesons uh, provided the ironwork, and we do have a copy of a paper he wrote with sufficient details that uh, one could actually do the analysis, which I did. Um, and he built a number of suspension bridges uh, using um, iron rods with holes in the end, uh, making a very large chain. We need to do a lot more about Finley, and it probably should be done in this building because it's the predecessor of what Ellett did on the suspension bridge. And we do know a lot about the bridges that he built. Um, 
if you go into Washington along the river, you see a place called Chain Bridge, James Finley. And I do have uh, an engraving and some other stuff on that as well. Well, that uh, brings us uh, to the Wheeling Suspension Bridge. And this fellow, um, Charles Ellett Jr., he was born uh, in Penn's Manor, uh, north of Philadelphia. And uh, his father uh, very much wished that he would stay down on the farm and uh, do the family business on fairly marginal land. He had other ideas and joined a surveying uh, crew on doing uh, canals and was later an associate engineer on the uh, Chesapeake in Ohio. And it was, uh, there's a correspondence. This is a, a word of caution to men uh, in the audience. Um, he would write every day to his wife in Lynchburg. It's a tremendous correspondence. Uh, and he took charge of everything, including the paint job in the rooms of the house and what have you. Um, and while he was uh, on this canal assignment, uh, he wrote that he had a chance to join his brothers in Illinois near Alton. He had some idea that he would go to Europe and um, study. And it was there in the correspondence that he came across uh, French suspension bridges. And he became a tremendous advocate. I won't go into all the details. I've got, as Janet will tell you, I've got drawers full of this stuff. Uh, but I'm not going to belabor you with that. Um, and he came back to the United States and wrote a memorial to Congress about a suspension bridge over the Potomac. And uh, it was discussed and finally um, rejected. This man was a man of great confidence and he said the nation has lost a splendid design. Now what we owe to the French not only is um, uh, a great uh, background in suspension bridges, mm -hmm. by the end of the American Civil War the French had built 500 and they load tested every one of them. And there's a, a, a sepoy regiment that was uh, at Algier. Um, and we're going to load cast the bridge, and it collapsed. We also have a uh, collapse in Broughton in England. The big change came because, like rolling these nine-inch beams, it was very difficult to roll a beam that was 10 feet long with uh, three or four-inch openings at the end so you could make a big chain. French contribution is the fact that they use wire. And this meant that you could build up a cable on the suspension bridge of about 1,800 wires per cable, and you could get something that is really strong. And the great uh, advantage here in Wheelie is that you could produce this wire by the mile. Um, not only for barbed wire and agricultural purposes, but for suspension bridges. And um, there was a contest, two contests as a matter of fact, about suspension bridges. One of them was here at Wheeling, and the other was over Niagara. And he was in competition with uh, John Robley. Um, I'm not sure how it happened, but he got both contracts and succeeded in building a, a temporary bridge at Niagara and uh, 
about the contract here, and I think uh, quite justly, the Roebling design had a uh, pier in the middle and inside of the bridge into the river, and uh, a show of, uh, of great tenacity, they recovered the cables and put them up again. And this time, uh, the Roebling firm got the job of rehabilitating the bridge under um, John Roebling's son, Washington. And it was here that he gathered all of these six cables into two cables on each side. And this you can see on the bridge when you go there. You will not see the garlands um, at all. And Ellen, uh, always confident, uh, was called to Wheeling about the bridge and had it back in service with a man called McComas um, within a month of the disaster. It was quite a remarkable uh, feat on his part. And uh, being the arrogant fellow that he, you wouldn't want to go to dinner with this guy. Um, because, um, and he told, uh, he told the people at Wheeling, this is your chance. We'll rebuild this bridge and we'll put the railway on it. And tracks were actually laid and uh, wagons were taken across, but not locomotives. Uh, I've done a lot of work on this and analysis of it. And uh, you'll be uh, interested to know that when you uh, draw wire through these dies, each die is slightly smaller, and it pulls the wire out, and it works it. And uh, the wrought iron, which is good for about uh, 40 to 50,000 pounds per square inch, um, after you work the wires, I got values of eight, 83,000. This is really superior stuff. And the point is that when you put it through the dies, it Proof tests every inch of wire. Because if there's a fault, the wire will break. And so as I say, there are about 1,800 of these wires. And uh, in the work that we did in uh, 1991 on this, um, we opened up these cables. And it was amazing um, what good condition they were in. They were in a bed of red lead, which isn't allowed anymore. The last time I used that was on the Delaware Aqueduct, and I uh, wasn't given a court uh, sentence. <laughs> but that, that isn't used. This was a paste that was put in the wires as they were laid out, and it was just wonderful stuff. Um, so I was able to count the wires um, and to reanalyze this and show that uh, it is perfectly safe. The problem, of course, was that they didn't understand um, aerodynamics, and a light wooden deck would be caught in the wind and uh, destroyed, like the bridge in the state of Washington. Various decks were used, and I got involved in, uh, in the 60s, and the deck at that time was wood stiffly trusses on the side so that it wouldn't twist and, and, uh, and collapse. So I worked on this bridge in one form or another uh, since 1963 or 64 uh, and been involved in every one of the restorations. Uh, it's truly a notable bridge. Um, it's never had the publicity that um, it deserves, and I was, I must tell you, I was rather unhappy that the new West Virginia Quarter has a different bridge on it. I was hoping we would have the only suspension bridge. We didn't. Now, um, the interesting thing about the, the Weaving Suspension Bridge here was that every part of that bridge was made locally. 
nothing was imported like this building and the nine inch beams. The wire was drawn here. Um, all of the fittings are wood and we even know the quarry where the um, uh, stone was. <coughs> we can see the placement out here if you see as you come in. Um, so if you can build the world's greatest bridge with local materials under the supervision of a really uh, uh, man, a uh, genius engineer. And um, here it was, all done in weaving, every bit of it, including the wooden deck. Uh, and it still survives. People thought these are new cables, but they're not. We added some wires for broken cables, but essentially the cables that are there are the original of 1849. Now, are there any questions that I, uh, Gene? Do you know what company made the wire and, and where were they? Bartley. Okay, Bartley, okay, and wh but where were they located? What? Where were they? Were they in South Wheeling or? Yes. Okay, what's the name of the company again? Bartley, B-O-D-L-E-Y? Yes, that's it. Yeah. That's it. And they ship eight foot diameter coils of their wire all over the place, as far as Minnesota and uh, as far south as Texas. Really superior stuff. Yeah? I, I've only been in Wheeling uh, 10 years, and I started exploring the old buildings and bridges and whatnot, and I was very pleased with myself when I noticed the gouge at the top of the, of the bridge. Uh, the, what do you call the vertical stanchions or whatever that hold it in in that uh, in that uh, towers. The towers. yeah the towers and yeah. I realized that was where the cables had come off and, and rubbed into the top of the tower and then I read that in your book and I was so disappointed that I didn't discover it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a very um, athletic friend who's uh, Don Sanga and. Um, we were inspecting the anchorages on the wheeling side of the bridge, and I wasn't sure I was ever going to get him out. He, uh, we went in head first, and it's very difficult when you're down there to turn around. Um, but that anchorage is under the street. If you go on the wheeling side, and you have a light, and you shine it in there, you can see how the wire cables are connected to um, iron I-beams that carry on into the ground. And you want to make sure that the cables going into the tower from the bridge side match the ones from the other so you don't put heavy bending on those stone towers. Uh, there's, some, there's some real subtleties work if, uh, once you get into it. I have another question. Are the wires are wrought iron? Yes. Okay, but when when you were talking about the wrought iron in the building, I thought you said that the strength was in compression. No, that's cast iron. Oh, that's cast iron. That's cast iron from a uh, <coughs> a furnace. So wrought iron then has strength in. Yeah, what you do, you you try to reduce the amount of carbon in cast iron, which is okay. as high as three and a half percent, and you reduce it down to almost zero, less than half a percent, and you get a very ductile material which has high tensile strength as well as compression strength. Okay. But wherever it's going to take a vertical load like these columns, you might as well use uh, casting. Uh -huh. And uh, Wheeling was famous for its cast iron work. But the cast iron is the cheapest thing. You can do gray iron. Uh, you can take it directly from the, from the furnace and cast it into all sorts of various shapes. Uh, steel didn't come in until um, 1883, or even later in this area. So we're talking about iron, not steel, on the uh, suspension bridge. And 
one more question. You said that the um, the quarry was around here for the stone. Where was that? Do you know? Yeah, I, I'd have to look that up. It's along the river, and it could be it could be floated up here to enlarge. Okay, it's probably in your book. I did. I'll go back and. It look. is. Well, I'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to review that. Okay. But we knew all of that. And if there's any repair work on this building, uh, we can get the original source. Which is, from a preservationist point of view, the thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I read in uh, somewhere that the stonemason who got those stones out uh, ended up having some left over. And so he built his house of it. Uh, it's on Wood Street, I believe. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, there, there was a great business in using using Roman stones in the Middle Ages. Right, yes. Yeah. Just right. go to an archaeological yeah. site and yeah. pick out your stones. Yeah. What was happening with the cable snapping in you know, the last several years? Uh, well, there, I need to say something about that. Um, John Roebling um, was educated in Berlin um, and came to this country. Um, and he devised a system of the cables uh, with these stay cables, these straight wire cables. And um, this was a hallmark of uh, Roebling's work. And when Washington was asked to revise, to rebuild the bridge after 1854, uh, in his autobiography, which Sienga has published, he said he didn't really believe in these things, but it was a, a hallmark of the company and I'm going to put them back in. Now the problem with them is that there are various lengths. So if you get a very hot day, the longer ones and the shorter ones don't expand at the same length. Well, you can't treat this like a violin and tune up these every day. Um, they act as a, an additional strength to the bridge. But I think Washington was right, and we have really gone away from that. Um, these stay cables. John. And Henry, that's been happening when it's been way below zero. 15 degrees below zero was the last one. So that's it's the same. Yeah, it was, it'll shrink. And st yeah, you're right. It, 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 that's been, you know, just to bring you up to speed, That's that happened when it was the, the coldest it's been here in years. Now there's 15 some, below zero the last one. There's um. Another set of cables, because of the twisting of 1854, and they are horizontal cables, and one of them goes into the music hall in the basement. Uh, the others have piers uh, along the riverside, and that's to keep the deck from twisting. So those are storm cables. I believe that one uh, showed a considerable amount of rust on it, but I'm not sure about that. Okay. I... Another question back there? She has one. Oh, I'm sorry. There used to be a trolley system in Wheeling. Did that ever cross the bridge? Yes. But those are very lightweight uh, streetcars. Oh, okay. It's a tram system. And uh, um, the track was laid right down the middle of the bridge. Uh, and I think originally, I have to check on my notes on that, I think they were horse drawn. Mm -hmm. But that fit this whole system of streetcars. Could actually get across the river, but it was Ellet that wanted to run regular trains across the suspension bridge. 
there's a famous photograph from about 1907 or something of uh, the circus elephants yeah. coming across the bridge. Yeah. Anybody ever calculate how many elephants the bridge could hold? <laughs> I've never done that. But those, those are, that, that's legitimate. Uh, the circus was unloaded on the island and the elephants and others were brought across the suspension bridge. Uh, nothing happened. Yeah. So I guess those pachyderms don't weigh uh, as much as they thought they might. They don't march on the other side. Yeah. Going back to the idea of running the train across, do you think the bridge would have survived if they had tried that? Oh, yes, but they would have put more cables on it. They would enhance the cables a lot. And the vertical suspenders that go down to the deck would have to be augmented quite considerably. You wouldn't want those to break on you when you got a steam locomotive on there. This was an idea, you see, of, um, of uh, building the country. If you could get a train across there, you could go to St. Louis. See, that's powerful stuff when you tell the locals. If we can get the B&O across the river on the bridge, they could go all the way to St. Louis. And that, that is a point uh, during this whole um, operation from about 1830 up to the Civil War. Um, there was very strong belief here that Wheeling went out distance Pittsburgh considerably. It had the height of summer uh, navigation on the river because there's a big sandbar up there. Uh, they had the National Road and they had the Baltimore, Ohio, all coming into Wheeling. It was certain this was going to be the largest monopoly, uh, monopolist uh, in um, west of the mountains. And this would be the gateway to the west. Well, there's some of us that still believe that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in, in the, the, the cover bridge, or the suspension bridge case. What? That it was brought, this suspension bridge case, you know, the lawsuit over the, yeah. the, the river traffic. I mean, it was basically, meaning was a bigger metropolis at that time than Pittsburgh. Yeah, well, there's. Um, colleague of mine, she's a lawyer, and she's written a book on the legal aspects of the bridge. And Pittsburgh sources wanted to tear the bridge down because they were raising the height of the stacks on their uh, toes, and uh, there was some uh, possibility of setting the wooden deck on fire, and they wanted the bridge brought down wasn't to be. It's still there. But uh, that was one tactic by the Pittsburgh people um, to eliminate at least one of the big transport lakes at, at Wheeling. Now, I don't, I'm going to take you in that back room and suffer the, Lydia, I'm going to suffer the consequences. Come on.